Hello and welcome to our session on image-based sexual abuse impact on survivors. My name is Honza Červenka and I am a lawyer at McAllister Olivarius, a transatlantic law firm that focuses on representing victims of sexual discrimination, harassment, other forms of discrimination, as well as online abuse. And with me is my colleague and friend, Elena. Thank you, Honza. My name is Elena Michael, and I'm the co-founder and director of the Hashtag Not Your Porn campaign. We are fighting to protect non-consenting adults, under 18s, and sex workers from image-based sexual abuse. We have a packed session ready for you today. We'll begin with discussing what the term image-based sexual abuse means, before looking at some of the types of perpetrators and survivors that uh, can be impacted by this crime. Uh, we will also look on the impact of the crime um, and we'll conclude by discussing whether or not the human rights framework could help us fix this problem. So, image-based sexual abuse is really the current term, but we first called it revenge pornography, didn't we? Which I think um, was the first term because initially the first wave almost of cases that became talked about in the public were in the context of a partner or an ex-partner doing this to their ex-partner. Um, a lot of academics had a problem with that because the term revenge means that the victim did something worthy of a revenge. Pornography means that, you know, we have a, the pornographic industry. Um, and so both words people had issues with. The next term that we had, non-consensual pornography, is almost like a halfway house. Mm -hmm. um, it took away the focus from revenge um, to the lack of consent, which is absolutely what is central to the understanding of this crime, I think. Still had the word pornography in it, and that's, why I think, why primarily we now have the term image-based sexual abuse, which people who work in this area use, because it describes the medium, mm -hmm. images, videos, although sometimes recordings can, audio recordings can also play part. Um, and it then focuses on the fact that it really is a form of abuse. Um, it uses stigma, shame um, to abuse a person. So I think that's a, the term that we have now is, is a much more descriptive one and takes us away perhaps from the domestic relations focus where we started with. What do you think? Absolutely. And the evolution in the term is also paired with the evolution of how we view victim survivors, who can be a victim survivor and who also can be a perpetrator. In terms of victim survivors, broadly speaking, now we have three um, quite wide categories of non-consenting adults, under 18s and sex workers. But even now, the focus on who can be envisaged in legislation is a bit patchy. And there seems to be more of an emphasis on non-consenting adults because it's complicated with under 18s, especially in the UK in terms of to do with child pornography, again, a term that isn't great. Yeah. And also in terms of conceptualising whether sex workers can be envisaged because there seems to be this notion that they cannot be impacted by the same harm as a non-consenting mm -hmm. adult who doesn't do it in the course of their professionness. So that's victim survivors. And with that, like I mentioned, is also the evolution in terms of perpetrators. So of course, we still have that domestic relationship, ex-partners, whether that be casual or long-term, current partners, um, etc. But then it's opened up to a more broad category of third parties, which is split into individuals and now with the online safety bill, potentially platforms. Individuals, it could be someone that you've never met before that has no connection to you in a different country, or it could be an individual, someone in your community, a peer, a colleague, perhaps, or um, the current partner of an ex-partner. Mm -hmm. So it's really evolved, in t we've evolved in terms of our thinking of it, but we're also starting to recognise that this kind of behaviour is much more per pervasive than we initially first thought. And then you also have to contextualise that as well, that there will be bystanders perhaps in WhatsApp groups where this kind of non-consensual content is being shared, um, maybe in community settings where they are aware that this kind of sharing is happening, but don't... Um, take the necessary action. So we're really looking at a whole web of people and organisations and platforms that are involved in facilitating and in fact perpetuating the harm. Yeah, it clearly just happens across settings, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned websites because they are one of the chief culprits, I think. Um, and, and it's just quite outrageous to essentially have a website whose business model is in good part or sometimes exclusively based on sharing this kind of material without the 
consent of everybody who appears in it, monetizing it, placing mm -hmm. ads, and yeah. making money off of it. Um, we saw that in the case of Chrissy Chambers that, that McAllister Olivares represented, where it was her ex-partner who initially uploaded the videos to, to a porn website, Breath Dew. Um, but um, then we saw the videos spread. Um, and sometimes that's through the uh, intentional acts of other people who decide to download and re-upload. Sometimes the, the primary or the initial perpetrator mm -hmm. does that and just actually uploads the video on multiple sites, sometimes including the victim's name, which can just intensify the sort of harm that uh, can come their way. Um, and um, really, we, what we see is that this material can spread like wildfire. Absolutely. Um, on, you know, on day zero, it may be uploaded to one site. On day one, it may be on two, three, five. And you sort of, and oftentimes, people don't find out until weeks, months, perhaps sometimes years later, uh, until somebody notifies them. That's what, what often happens. Um, and by then, the video may have been viewed thousands of times or shared in tens of WhatsApp or Telegram groups. Um, really just spreading spreading the harm and making it much bigger than the initial act of um, uploading. Absolutely, and I think there's several points to add there as well. Often this kind of behaviour is interlinked with other forms of abuse yeah. as well in terms of harassment, perhaps it's sextortion, etc., which amplifies the harm online but also offline. The second point is in terms of the lifespan of this content, which, you, which you've mentioned online, but also it's interrelated offline of having to face the perpetrator again and again if they haven't mm -hmm. um, been held accountable because they're in your local community, um, living in constant fear and anxiety that if you move to a new town, those images are going to resurface. And the final point about in discovery is also we don't understand the um, extent of the harm or how many people this affects because it's so much dependent on the victim survivor being notified and not everybody knows that they can do a reverse image search or mm -hmm. knows people that would notify them, especially if it's happening across jurisdictions mm. and in different countries. Yeah. Um, in terms of the law, where we sit with the law and perhaps being re-traumatised by that process, um, how, how are victims treated by the law? What are their avenues to justice? That's another area where we need vast improvement. Many countries like the UK, like many states in America, have criminal laws outlawing the non-consensual sharing of, of uh, intimate image, images. Um, and so you'd think that perhaps the first place to go would be the police to report it as a crime, mm -hmm. that it is. Yeah. The problem with that, of course, is that there are many people who do not feel comfortable approaching the police, say illegal immigrants. How likely are they really to go and ask the police for help when doing that could end up in them being, being deported? Um, we, of course, have clients, as we're a civil law firm, we, we specialize in bringing civil lawsuits against uh, perpetrators, and that is certainly sometimes an avenue uh, that's available to people, but with many limitations, primarily around jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And nowadays when we have um, international lives where people date across borders, chat on dating apps across, across the globe, um, it's a lot harder to achieve justice against the perpetrator who lives on the other side of the globe than somebody who lives down the street. Um, and that's because if, if I live in the UK, my perpetrator lives in Brazil, South Africa. An English judge is unlikely to have effective jurisdiction over that person and really bring that person to justice. I, on the other hand, don't know the first thing about how to bring a lawsuit in Brazil South Africa, Japan, whatever the case may be. And so oftentimes we see victims ending up in a jurisdictional and judicial vacuum where they have theoretical avenues that they could pursue, but nobody with the power to make a difference able to take the case on. Absolutely. And there's also a disparity in education in terms mm -hmm. of the key intervention points with IBSA as well, um, which makes it incredibly difficult because, again, that process is re-traumatising of, like you know, you've said, going to the lawyers for example, um, having to retell your case or telling the police and being met by someone that isn't an expert or hasn't got experience of through the criminal law investigating this kind of crime, which leads us to conclude that this is an incomplete system of protections or preventions, both in terms of platform liability, um, in terms of the international response, 
but also it's got to be beyond just the framework of the law. It's also got to be in terms of policy, safety by design. It, it really is a collective effort, which then brings me to my final question, really. How can the human rights framework, which is an international framework, potentially be used to support victim survivors and help them access justice? I think it would provide a really interesting avenue for change. Um, the downside with human rights as a framework that I see is that it originated really with actions against the government mm -hmm. to stop government outreach um, and to make sure that the government doesn't uh, impinge on our, on our human rights. In the cases of image-based sexual abuse, it rarely is the government that's the bad actor. Mm -hmm. um, it's individuals, perhaps it's the websites that allow for distribution of this content. And so for the human rights framework, it feels natural, it feels like it should be a human right mm -hmm. to have control over your persona, your image, and to be free from harassment and uh, stigmatization to this degree, mm -hmm. shunning of, 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 of people. Um, but in order to be effective, I think we would need to tweak it so that it is enforceable against individuals and that it provides for quick solutions. When um, a video needs to be taken down, uh, instead of flagging it and leaving it on the website for weeks and months, can it just be quarantined to begin with? Mm -hmm. And then perhaps go through a process, oh, should it be taken down, should it not be taken down? We, obviously, the, the framework will need time to make sure that it's fair on everybody. Yeah. But it also, in order to be effective, needs to have velocity to it, which right now, none of the options that we have or that victims and survivors have provide. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us for our talk today. We hope you enjoyed it. We would love to continue the discussion and uh, perhaps talk to you through some of the chat functions at the conference or via Twitter or email. We'd love to hear from you and keep this conversation going. Thank you so much and we really hope you enjoy the rest of RightsCon. <laughs>